in Van Nuys, California, the Cheyenne helicopter made its first public flight. helicopter with wings, a propeller on the tail pushing it forward like a fighter plane. This is the Lockheed AH-56 Cheyenne, the fastest, most advanced attack helicopter ever built. In the late 60s, it could fly circles around anything else in the sky. Nearly 50 knots faster than today's Apache, it could dive at a target, then reverse its propeller mid-dive to slow down and give the pilot more time to aim. No other helicopter could do that. The Army wanted 600 of them, but they got 10 prototypes. The Cheyenne's downfall came from every direction. A test pilot died when his aircraft broke apart in midair, exposing serious technical problems. Costs exploded from half a million dollars per helicopter to over 4 million, and while Lockheed struggled with these issues, the simpler AH-1 Cobra was already in Vietnam doing the same job well enough, and doing it for a fraction of the cost. On August 9, 1972, after spending over $400 million, the Army canceled the program. The Cheyenne was too advanced, too expensive, and too trouble to survive. And in this video, we'll cover its story. American troops in Vietnam had a problem. When they needed close air support, they had to call the Air Force, request a strike, wait for jets to arrive, and then hope the coordinates were accurate. In the chaos of jungle warfare, that delay could mean the difference between winning a firefight and losing it. Helicopters changed that calculation. The Bell UH-1 Huey was already there, flying troops and supplies. Some enterprising army units started mounting machine guns and rocket pods on their Hueys, turning transport helicopters into impromptu gunships. During America's involvement in Vietnam, it was discovered that adding firepower to a Huey became a very effective weapon on the battlefield. Suddenly, you had an aircraft that could hover over the battlefield, suppress enemy fire, protect landing zones, and it belonged to the Army, not the Air Force. But these armed Hueys were never designed for combat. They were slow, vulnerable, and their weapons were bolted on as afterthoughts. The Army knew that they needed something purpose-built, a helicopter designed from the ground up to fight. In 1964, the Army issued a request for a proposal for something called the Advanced Aerial Fire Support System. The name was deliberately vague. The ambiguity was intended to keep the United States Air Force in the dark on the intentions of the Army, as the Air Force was already concerned about the Army's helicopter infatuation for use in close air support. This was more than just designing a new helicopter, it, it was a turf war. The Air Force had always controlled close air support with fixed-wind aircraft. The Army wanted its own firepower under its own command without having to ask permission. Twelve companies submitted proposals by the November 24, 1964 deadline. The requirements were aggressive. Hover at 6,000 feet in 95 degree heat, important for the hot and humid climate of Southeast Asia. Reach speeds of 220 knots, 50% faster than existing helicopters, and ferry range of 2100 nautical miles. Two finalists emerged, Sikorsky, with decades of helicopter experience, and Lockheed, famous for the P-38 Lightning and the U-2 spy plane, but with no operational military helicopters to their name. Sikorsky proposed a conventional design, faster and more heavily armed than existing helicopters, but still fundamentally a traditional helicopter. Lockheed's proposal, in classic Lockheed fashion, was something else entirely. A compound helicopter that combined airplane and helicopter features in ways no one had attempted before. On March 23, 1966, Lockheed won. The Army awarded them a contract for 10 prototypes designated the AH-56A. What they proposed barely even looked like a helicopter at all. As mentioned before, Lockheed's design was radical, 
a compound helicopter that combined helicopter and plane features for unprecedented performance. The design included a rigid main rotor, low-mounted wings, and a pusher propeller at the tail. Traditional helicopters hit a speed wall. The main rotor does everything, lifting, thrusting forward, control and direction. As speed increases, the rotor blade advancing into the airflow generates more lift than the retreating blade, causing vibration and control problems. Most helicopters top out at around 150 to 170 knots because of this. Lockheed solved it by making the helicopter fly more like an airplane at high speed. The Cheyenne used an innovative propulsion system where the power plant drove a rigid, four-blade, gyro-stabilized main motor, the tail-mounted anti-torque rotor, and the pusher propeller at the extreme end of the tail boom. At low speeds, hovering, takeoff, landing, all power went to the main and anti-torque rotors, and it flew like a conventional helicopter. But during forward flight, all about 700 horsepower was shafted to the pusher propeller. The stub wings generated lift, the main rotor windmilled with minimal power, and the pusher propeller drove the aircraft forward. The result was capabilities no other helicopter possessed. In a conventional helicopter, if you want to go faster, you push your nose forward. You want to slow down, well you push it back. The Cheyenne didn't work that way. It could accelerate or decelerate while keeping its nose level, or pitch its nose up and down while hovering in place. This gave it combat advantages that were almost unfair. Museum curator Bob Mitchell described one particularly impressive maneuver. He said, one of the key factors in gunship operation, certainly when conducting driving fire, is that your speed builds exponentially. So you only have a couple of seconds to acquire, engage, then start your recovery. On the Cheyenne, the pilot could enter his dive, then reverse the rust on the pusher to slow the aircraft down considerably, allowing him to fixate on the target, fire, and then start his recovery. It's pretty wild shit for 1960s technology, right? Imagine diving at a target, then reversing your propeller mid-dive to break in mid-air while keeping your nose pointed at the enemy, right? No attack helicopter before or since could do that. The armament matched the revolutionary design as well. A 30mm XM140 cannon sat in a belly turret with either a 40mm XM129 grenade launcher or a 7.62 minigun in the nose turret. Six wing hardpoints could carry Hughes tow anti-tank missiles or 2.75 inch rocket pods. The crew sat in tandem, gunner in front, pilot elevated behind them for better visibility. The gunner seat swiveled to follow the gun turret with fire control and periscope sighting systems moving with him. Lockheed rolled out the first AH-56A on May 3, 1967, and the Army christened it the Cheyenne. The first flight came on September 21, 1967. Test pilot Don Segner took the second prototype up for 26 minutes. The flight proved the design sound, responsive, and reliable. By December 1967, the Cheyenne had already been clocked just under 200 miles per hour. During testing, it reached a maximum speed of 277 miles per hour, faster than the Apache flies today, more than 50 years later. The Secretary of Defense approved pre-production funding on January 8, 1968, supporting an initial order for 375 aircraft. Initial operating capability was planned for 1972, with an optimistic target of late 1970. The Cheyenne was real, it was flying, and it exceeded expectations. But beneath the surface, problems were developing, problems that would prove fatal. During early flight tests, engineers discovered a rotor instability issue when flying at low altitude in ground effect. As they expand the flight envelope, this instability and other minor problems appeared and were quickly addressed. But one problem resisted all attempts at a fix. Pilots called it the half P hop. Under certain conditions, the rigid rotor system would begin oscillating, bouncing the helicopter up and down. Lockheed engineers developed modifications to the flight control system, confident they could solve it. It seemed like a solvable engineering challenge, annoying but not fatal. What they didn't account for was the program running out of time and money. Budget pressures were mounting. The war in Vietnam proved the need for attack helicopters, 
but was also consuming enormous amounts of money. There was limited money available for developmental projects like the Cheyang as well as the Air Force's F-111 and the C-5 Galaxy Transport. The cruel irony, the war that justified building the Cheyenne was also starving it of its funding. Cost climbed relentlessly. The helicopter went from an initial purchase price of half a million each in 1965 to over one million dollars by 1967. By 1972, the cost per unit had reached three million dollars, eventually hitting over four million per helicopter. The Army was also getting excellent results with their existing AH-1 Cobras in Vietnam, which was a simpler, cheaper gunship based on the Huey. It wasn't as advanced as the Cheyenne, but it was available immediately, and it worked. Every successful Cobra mission made the expensive, delayed Cheyenne harder to justify. Lockheed needed the flight test program to go smoothly. They needed to prove the Cheyenne was worth the wait and the money. On March 12, 1969, Test pilot David A. Bale took serial number 668828 up for a test flight. The helicopter began suffering severe rotor oscillations, up to three feet vertically. The rotors struck the tail boom and cockpit, separating the tail section. The helicopter broke apart in midair, and David was killed. The Army issued a cure notice to Lockheed on April 10th, citing 11 technical problems and unsatisfactory progress. Lockheed had 15 days to respond. Lockheed proposed fixes, including an improved flight control system. The Army felt the solution would delay the program further and increase cost even more. On May 19, 1969, citing Lockheed's inability to meet the production timeline, the Army canceled the production contract. They retained the development contract, hoping the issues could be resolved, but production was dead. Testing did continue, though. Lockheed still believed they could save the program. In September 1969, Cheyenne prototype number 10 underwent wind tunnel testing at NASA Ames Research Center to research the half-p hop and drag issues. The test was supposed to help solve the problem. Instead, it destroyed the helicopter. The engineers didn't realize that the fixed mount securing the aircraft in the wind tunnel wouldn't allow the helicopter to move relative to the rotor as it did in flight. There was no natural dampening of the rotor pitching motion, and the remote controllers had no sensory feedback from the helicopter. During high-speed testing to replicate the half-p hop vibration, the rotor oscillations accelerated out of control and struck the tail boom, and the helicopter tore itself apart inside the wind tunnel. In less than a year, Lockheed had lost two Cheyennes, one to a fatal crash, and one to a testing mistake. As a precaution, Cheyenne No. 9 was fitted with a downward firing ejection seat, since ejecting upward through a spinning rotor blades wouldn't be desirable. Testing limped forward into the early 1970s, but the program was dying. The Cheyenne's technical problems were compounded by politics. The Air Force A-10 Thunderbolt program was progressing well, and with the Cheyenne's unit cost now over $3 million, Congress began questioning the need for two similar close air support platforms. The Air Force viewed the Cheyenne as the Army encroaching on their mission. Why did the Army need an advanced attack helicopter when the Air Force was developing the A-10? The AH-1 Cobra continued proving itself in Vietnam and it wasn't as fast or sophisticated as the Cheyenne, topping out at around 140 knots compared to the Cheyenne's 212 knots. It didn't have the advanced fire control system or rigid rotor technology, but it was simple, reliable, and most importantly, available now. And it cost a fraction of what the Cheyenne would cost. Hoping to impress the Senate Armed Services Committee, Lockheed arranged a firepower demonstration at the Yuma Proving Grounds. Despite having successfully fired 130 tow missiles in previous tests, the first missile fired that day grounded itself. The missile failed. Not the helicopter, but perception mattered to congressmen looking for reasons to cut an expensive, troubled program. On August 9, 1972, after spending over $400 million with a unit cost exceeding $4 million, the Army finally canceled the Cheyenne program. 
Immediately afterwards, the army opened the Advanced Attack Helicopter Competition. This helicopter would incorporate many of the Cheyenne's advances, but prioritize reliability and cost over raw speed. That competition would eventually produce the AH-64 Apache, which replaced the Cobra and became the Army's primary attack helicopter for the next four decades. Ironically, Lockheed proposed a twin-engine version of the Cheyenne without the pusher propeller for the competition. They lost the Hughes design, which became the Apache. Just 10 total Cheyennes were ultimately produced. The Army spent $400 million and got nothing operational in return. But calling it a complete failure misses part of the story. The technologies Lockheed pioneered, the rigid rotor system, the combat helicopter concept, the integrated fire control, didn't disappear. They influenced every attack helicopter that came after, even if in less radical forms. Richard Birch, who piloted the AH-56A at Yuma Proving Ground, said years later, it was an incredible aircraft. It would have changed military aviation. He might be right, but in the early 1970s, with costs spiraling and the helicopters dying in tests, the army couldn't afford to find out. And sometimes, being too advanced is just as fatal as being obsolete. Very similar to my last video. You guys should 100% check that out if you haven't. One of the surviving Cheyenne prototypes sits at the U.S. Army Aviation Museum at Fort Rucker, Alabama. The distinctive pusher propeller, the stub wings, the angular fuselage, it still looks futuristic decades later. And you can see why pilots who flew it called it incredible. Bad timing, bad luck, and perhaps too much ambition killed the Cheyenne. It was designed during a war that drained budgets for development programs, fatal accidents eroded confidence in the design, and it competed against a simpler helicopter that was good enough for the job and immediately available. Man, it feels like I'm doing the Comanche video all over again. In warfare, good enough now consistently beats revolutionary later. The Apache that replaced it is slower, less maneuverable, and in some ways, you call it less capable than the Cheyenne. At least less capable than the Cheyenne would have been. But the Apache worked. It proved reliable, and it became one of the most successful attack helicopters in history. Like, they're still using this thing. The Cheyenne represents all the what-ifs of military aviation. What attack helicopters might have become if Lockheed had solved the technical problems, if budgets had been squeezed by Vietnam, if that test pilot had survived, if that wind tunnel test had been properly configured. Museum curator Bob Mitchell put it simply, it was a spectacular concept, and it's an aircraft that still to this day is way ahead of its time. And he's right. The fastest, most advanced attack helicopter of its era, ultimately too revolutionary for its own good. The Lockheed AH-56 Cheyenne. The helicopter that could have changed everything, but never got the chance.